Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast about foreign policy and world affairs. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. And in this show, we discuss topical global issues, have conversations with foreign affairs thought leaders and newsmakers, and give you the context you need to understand the world today. Go to globaldispatchespodcast.com to learn more. And now on with the show. The fish you eat may have been caught by slaves. Most Thai fishing boats operating in the South China Sea are dependent on migrant labor. But many of these vessels are essentially floating slave ships in which migrant workers are forced into a kind of debt bondage from which they cannot escape. Journalist Ian Urbina covered this issue for years for the New York Times. He reported from land and sea to offer a first-hand account of both the conditions on these ships and the broader economic, political, and environmental forces that propel slavery on fishing boats in the South China Sea. Ian Urbina is on the podcast today to discuss his reporting on this issue, which is included in his new book, The Outlaw Ocean, Journeys Across the Last Untamed Frontier. We kick off discussing the plight of these debt-bonded laborers before having a broader conversation about the issue of slavery at sea. Uh, I'll post a link to the book on globaldispatchespodcast.com, but I do want to emphasize that this conversation is really focused on just one part of his book, a chapter on sea slavery. The book itself is a much more expansive look at oceans and the rule of law and maritime crime. As always, please feel free to get in touch with me if you have suggestions of people I should interview or topics I should cover. I love hearing from you. Also, big thank you to my supporters on Patreon who enable this show to keep on keeping on. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You can become a premium subscriber to the show and unlock a host of rewards, including bonus episodes and subscriptions to my news clips delivered to your inbox every morning by going to patreon.com slash global dispatches or following the links in the description field of this podcast episode or on global dispatches podcast.com. Thank you. Thank you. I really do. Thank you. You, you keep the lights on around here. And now here is my conversation with journalist Ian Urbina. Human trafficking and labor trafficking obviously is a global problem. And, um, as it plays out specifically in the fishing industry, there's an acute um, version of this problem on the South China Sea. So if you think of um, Malaysia and um, Cambodia and Laos and Thailand sort of as the relevant countries here um, and and Myanmar, those countries are, are the ones that I focused on uh, in this book. However, I do think it's really important to note that um, – sea slavery, as it's often called, or, you know, trafficking onto uh, fishing vessels, um, you know, has been well documented off the coast of Somalia and off the coast of New Zealand and near S- South Korea. Um, uh, so I just chose to, to focus on this problem on the South China Sea and specifically in the Thai fishing fleet. And then one of the reasons to do that is that um, the sheer size of that fishing fleet is, um, is uh, really huge. And the percentage of men and boys who are working as deckhands on those boats um, that are migrant workers and um, more often than not trafficked migrant workers is very high. Um, And so the situation of sea slavery and who those folks are, they're typically Burmese or or people from Myanmar um, or uh, Cambodians or Laotians who have... Uh, you know, are in desperate need of work, and uh, one day they meet uh, what um, a person that would probably describe themselves as a labor broker, but might also be described as a human trafficker. Uh, this person says, "Hey, look, um, I've got a job um, possibility that I could offer you in Thailand uh, in the construction industry." Um, The Cambodian in this case might say, but I don't have a cent to my name and I don't have any way to get into Thailand. And the trafficker says, don't worry about it. I can um, arrange for transport and cover the costs and we'll figure out the debt later. Um, You know, the 
the Cambodian gets in a truck one night, you know, is ferried across the border and begins usually a multi-day, sometimes multi-week journey to what he thought was going to be a construction job, but usually along the way realizes is not uh, and is instead a job on a fishing vessel. Um, and uh, that person is brought to the port. Uh, and usually under, by the time you get to the port, usually there's, you know, it's the, the number of people in your uh, group is usually grown from two or three to maybe a dozen um, guys and boys. Uh, they get to the port, the trafficker essentially sells the debt, you know, if it costs, say, 300 bucks for um, the transport and the getting across the border um, that per, per man then um, the trafficker sells those guys in that debt to the captain. The captain pays the trafficker 300 bucks mm. And per so now man. the individuals are indebted to the captain as opposed to that first trafficker. Exactly. And that's the beginning of what some folks call debt bondage, where the, the kid or the man, you know, essentially is supposed to work off that debt. Um, now, what's different, from normal debt bondage is when you're in a factory and you got there and you have a debt, there's oftentimes some level of bookkeeping and some sort of science behind the debt, the chipping away at the debt. And when you're on a fishing boat and you leave shore, the minute you're out to sea, um, there, there really isn't any bookkeeping. You stay on that ship as long as the captain decides you're going to stay on that ship. And, and um, so those uh, individuals can be on there for six months, nine months, um, five years, you know, it, it really varies. Um, and oftentimes they attempt to escape. Uh, they try to swim to shore. If they're within sight of some fleck of land, they are usually are in some foreign countries waters and they don't speak the language. Many of these guys don't know how to swim. Sometimes, um, the captains hire bounty hunters essentially to track these guys down. And from the perspective of the captains, they often don't think they're doing anything wrong. They paid good money for this guy's labor. Um, debt bondage is illegal in m much of the West and the developed world, but it's fairly common in much of the underdeveloped world. Um, and so they feel like there's been a, this, this escape of the deckhand in their view is an instance of thievery, you know, um, and so they feel like it's merited to hire someone to go get that property back. Um, and in any case, uh, um, that's how some folks escape. That's how some folks die. Uh, and other folks um, attempt to um, clear their debt as long as it takes and, and a small percentage return home. Uh, even smaller percentage return home with any money in their pocket. Um, so can you, uh, so, so as part of your reporting uh, of the book and, and of the articles that you wrote uh, over the course of the years uh, from the South China Sea, you, you boarded these boats. Uh, you sort of embedded yourself with some of these indentured servants, these bonded, you know, these, these basically these, these sea slaves. Can you describe the conditions on, on these boats and, and sort of, you know, stories that you, that you encountered, people you encountered? Yeah. The, the boats that rely on this sort of labor tend to be the bottom of the barrel um, and under automated, you know, so they're using cheap labor to do things that most other fleets use machines for. Um, and they're, you know, at the end of their life, uh, and they're often fishing the least economical form of fish. Um, so the conditions tend to be just the worst. So the, for example, the, one of the boats we got on early on during the reporting, um, took some doing to get to, it, um, took a couple of days to hopscotch our way a couple hundred miles offshore and get on one of these long haul boats. Um, this boat was extremely rat and roach infested, um, there were so many, there was a dog on board and so many rats sort of walking around at leisure, almost like city squirrels, um, even in broad daylight, not scurrying about that. At one point we filmed, um, a rat walking right by the dog's head and eating out of his bowl and then sort of sauntering off. Um, uh, the, this boat had 40 Cambodian, um, debt bonded workers, about five Thai officers. Um, and, uh, the, the, the men, 
and boys. There were um, one guy was as young as 13, we guessed. Um, there were some men who were in their late 20s. Um, they all sleep in uh, this small sort of cavern in the back of the ship, um, uh, tightly packed and extremely hot and dingy. Um, they work typically 18 to 20 hour days. Um, and uh, because of the hygienic conditions or the lack of hygiene, uh, infection is one of the biggest threats on board. Uh, you get sick or injured or, or a severe cut. Um, uh, there's not a whole lot to do. They're not, not meds on board. Um, and then violence is the other big threat. The bosun who is, um, uh, uh, the sort of officer who is in charge of, um, controlling the crew and typically speaks both the language of the crew and the language of the officers, um, is a, is usually a scary character. And the on this enforcer point, type. Right. Exactly. Uh, so we spent a couple of days on this vessel and talked to the boys and men. And at one point, we, uh, we being the photographer and I, uh, interviewed this one boy in, in his broken English and with help of a translator, he described how impossible clearing your debt is actually once you leave shore. And he sort of gestured as if he was trying to swipe at his own shadow and and said, can't catch, can't catch. And he was referring to the elusiveness of his shadow was much like the um, impossibility of truly ever chipping away at your debt and getting permission to leave. So what struck me uh, about your reporting is, is not only sort of the vivid descriptions of these shipping vessels and, and the slavery conditions of the people on board, but also that there's something of like an underground railroad for groups, individuals, NGOs that are trying to, to free uh, some of these slaves. How, do you, how did you find those groups? And, and can you talk a little bit about what those groups are and how they operate? Yes, yeah, so I think your metaphor is right. The Underground Railroad is apt. They, it is this decentralized sort of coalition of underfunded, undermanned NGOs that are typically based right near the port. And uh, their main job is to be on the ready for foreign crew that come into port and cry for help. And these NGOs don't usually have direct access in the port. They can't go there and wait dockside or even board boats or inspect them or interview anyone. Um, but word is passed around uh, that uh, with phone numbers and names of people that can be called if they need help. And if a, a crew member pulls into, say, Songkhla, which is a city in a port town in Thailand, and and um, someone in port on the dock side says, uh, you know, there's, say, someone from the same town um, uh, as where they are. Um, uh, let me pause here because there's an incoming call. Let me just let it play yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Sorry. No problem. No problem. Let's mark it. It's, so it stops interrupting. Yeah, it's fine. I don't hear a ring or anything on my end. Oh, uh, it just, um, you go silent, and I think I do for a, a oh, millisecond. Okay. Yeah, that's okay, fine. Okay, it's fine. Gone no problem. So, how, how these, um, how the Underground Railroad works is usually uh, the, crew from a specific village or province or country knows who the people are and the phone numbers for those people um, if they're in trouble. And if they get access to a cell phone, then they call. And usually the call comes in after someone's made a run for it and they're hiding out somewhere in port or they're hiding out somewhere near port. And the call will come into one of these groups and Stella Maris is the name of one example in, in Thailand. Uh, and usually the, the person fleeing, the sea slave, will have no idea where they are because they're not from, this is a Burmese kid or a, a Cambodian young man in, in a port town in, Song, in Thailand and they don't speak Thai and they have no idea um, how to describe their location. So they do so visually I'm near a house of this color and a street that looks like this. And, and that's when the scramble begins on the part of the advocates um, to try to figure out where that person is and to get there quickly. 
And it is a bit of a race because the captains also have their own um, grid of informants. Oftentimes they're the motorcycle, the moped taxi drivers who for a fee um, will call in tips to the captains or to one key figure at the port. Hey, I, I saw a guy who's obviously not Thai, um, who looks like he's not at a place um, at this location, this, and word will go from the port guy to uh, the boat that was missing a man. And quickly the, the captain or the bosun of that boat will send folks out to that location to try to round up the spotted escapee. And so th that intel and that underground grid of, of almost bounty hunters are, are scrambling on the one hand and there's money to be made there. Well, on the other hand, the advocates are trying to do the same thing. And if they can find the guy first, then they usually bring him to a safe house. Sometimes that's bunk beds above the office, as is the case in Songkla at Stella Maris. Oftentimes, you know, 20 miles outside the city, there's a house that someone, you know, allows, keeps a couple beds open for this very situation. Um, and they're their challenge then is to try to get the person as far away from the port as quickly as possible. Because if they house that person there for too long, word gets out. These are small places and, and the um, bounty hunters are armed and, and they, um, they don't play around. And so they, they will show up and forcefully take the guy back. Um, and that happened. Um, every permutation of what I just described happened um, during the reporting, uh, we, we chronicled the story of Lang Long, who is one, um, such case. Yeah. Can, can uh, you tell the story? Cause, mm -hmm. cause it, it, sure. it's, it's obviously it's like very tragic. Uh, but I think it's also very like illustrative of a lot of, of aspects of, of this issue. Mm -hmm. So Lang Long is a little different in that he didn't flee and then get rescued by the underground railroad. He f pled for help. So Lang Long is a Cambodian man who uh, ver follows the story I told. He you know, was promised a job in construction by a trafficker. He was trafficked into the country, into Thailand from Cambodia. He ends up um, at the port. He ends up on a boat. Off to sea he goes. He um, is at sea for a while, um, brutally beaten over and over again, uh, horribly seasick, has never spent time offshore. Um, struggles to even discern between different types of fish, and that brings more beatings. He eventually tries to escape. When he escapes, he's caught. He jumps overboard um, when a, when another vessel is near a mothership that's delivering supplies. Um, he's caught, brought back to the vessel, and from then forward, uh, for um, whenever Lang Lung was not working, he was shackled by the neck. And during a subsequent visit of the supply ship to that fishing vessel way out at sea, someone on the supply ship noticed a man shackled by the neck and was scandalized. And when he got, when that person got back to shore, he reported what he had seen to Stella Maris. Stella Maris then with this guy on the supply ship began orchestrating um, a negotiation and raising funds to buy Lang Long's um, um, freedom. And that was a several month process where multiple visits out to the fishing boat and negotiations happen, money exchanged hand, hands, and Lang Long was um, put on the supply ship and let go. Um, and um, I interviewed and began following Lang Long's story um, uh, several days after he came back to shore, and then over the course of the next couple of years, tracked his um, progress uh, in his attempt to put his life back together. So you know, what you describe, you know, it just seems to, there's like this whole economy that's like built around, uh, you know, slaves at sea, whether it's for fishing. And, and then of course the headhunters that are purchased or the, you know, taxi driver informants, uh, like, but, but at the heart of it, it seems to be this like insatiable appetite for, for fish from Thailand or from the South China sea by, by us consumers. So I, I guess, can you talk like why, is this such a, a massive issue? Is it just there's this demand for, for cheap labor? And why is there that demand for, for such mm -hmm. cheap labor? So I think the demand for cheap labor is, is a demand for fish. And the demand for fish is getting more intense because there are fewer of them. So at root, you have a, almost an environmental pro problem uh, in which the near shore stocks and the distant shore stocks of fish have 
crashed because there's been decades of overfishing, too many boats on the water, um, pulling too many fish from the water, pulling the fish that are too young, so no chance for stocks to replenish, et cetera, et cetera. So what that means is now boats are having to go much further away to even break even. And so there's a desperation within the industry as don't forget the global consumption of seafood has just gone through the roof, um, driven by um, China to a large degree, but also by the West, um, as people have moved away from other types of um, uh, meat, if you will, um, they've moved more um, towards seafood. So the global demand for fish has gone up. The global stock of fish to be fished has gone down. And what that has meant as um, captains and fleets have to find creative ways to cut costs. And one of the ways that some of the um, lower end uh, sub economies, so the fleet that are not technologically advanced and they still are getting subsidized and so there are too many boats um, on the water to begin with all those things um, those fleets are more inclined to turn towards this sort of labor so uh, it seems that you know in large part because of reporting reporting by you and and by other journalists who have covered this issue over the years the thai government has um stepped up or at least sort of wants to be seen as being more aggressively taking on uh, this issue of, of, you know, indentured servitude at sea. Can you mm -hmm. talk a, a little bit about what those government efforts look like? Yeah, so I think you're exactly correct that the Thai government has in the last four or five years really um, tried to reform uh, itself. Um, that pressure has come from journalists to some degree, but also the U.S. State Department and the EU have played a big role in, in applying pres pressure. The development community all have sort of come into sync and applied pressure. Um, the Thai government has um, implemented in the last several years a bunch of different approaches. One is um, we need to get a better sense of what vessels are on the water and where are they. And so uh, a registration system, both of the vessels, as well as to some degree of the migrant workers who are bring, being brought into the country. Because Thai, Thailand is a fairly middle class country. Unemployment is under 2%. Um, so Thais don't typically, Thai men don't typically take these jobs anymore. So the country is very dependent on foreign labor, but for a long time, that foreign labor was just allowed to come in in these dangerously illegal fashions. And there was no, um, the, the, the migrant workers who were coming in had no ID identification and no recourse uh, when they were trapped. And so the Thai government has tried to address that by handing out these identity cards to migrants that that um, uh, um, make it their, their access to the government more accessible um, or more established. Um, they've also done a sort of what's called a port in, port, a, port out system, which is where the Thai government uh, has a set protocol for ships that were coming in and sort of a clipboard full of questions about where it went, what it caught, with who, etc. There are big problems with every one of these things I'm citing. Um, and a lot of the problems are, they sound really good in theory, but the application of them is very limited by um, more subtle, banal variables, like a lack of translators who can actually talk directly to the workers, um, a lack of a structure where you can win the trust of the workers um, because they know if they tell you things that if they break script from what the captain told them to say as they were approaching port, they know that there's they're not going to be left there and face the bosun as they leave port 12 hours later and likely be killed for it. Right now, there are very few ways that it feels safe to migrant workers to actually engage in many of the safeguards that the government has set up. So a lot of these steps have been very hard fought and really impressive on paper, but in application, they're still lacking um, because of a, a, a culture of a bureaucratic culture where there are very few people who are trained to really do good investigative work that is with a sort of human rights mindset. 
Um, and so there's a lot of box checking going on, mm. but um, it's not as protective as it should be. So, so, I mean, would you think that today the situation is not that much improved from when, you know, you were on the ships a, a few years ago? No, I wouldn't say that. I think it is significantly improved um, partially because the while those infrastructural changes have occurred, but they have flaws, there's also this overarching aura of um, if you are caught by anyone, whether it's a environmental, um, you know, um, Envi environmental Justice Foundation is an example of an organization that's based in the region and polices this issue, and they do their own independent investigations. Human Rights Watch is another. Um, Greenpeace is another. Uh, so there's all the there are all these NGOs that are attempting to to do what the government isn't effectively doing. There are lots of journalists there snooping around to try to keep an eye on this issue as well. Then there's the government itself that's trying to do stuff, as well as there are, are corporate players who that are trying to clean up their own supply chains, and they have inspectors. So there's a whole community of folks who are attempting on their own accord to keep an eye on this. Whether they're doing so effectively or not, we can leave to the side, but there's a lot of them. And that has translated into a general sense of fear by the Thai government and by fishing companies and fishing boat captains that if they get caught by any of these players and get put on the front page of the New York Times again and get downgraded by the State Department on their trafficking rankings or get yellow carded by the EU on these very issues, there will be hell to pay. And um, so I think that overall fear has caused um, the industry to be a bit more careful. Um, and furthermore, there have been some singular actions that had big effects. So for example, the Thai government called in, it had at one point 55 vessels that were Thai flag, Thai owned vessels in distant waters all over the world, right? And when all these stories broke, the Thai government said, all of you have to come into port because we need to get a baseline on what's going on here because we're getting beaten up in the press. And, and so a, the bulk of them came into port. And when they were into, in port, new regulations came down. And a lot of them said, we can't comply with those regulations and stay in business. So a lot of them are still sitting in port in Kantang anchored because they can't. Some of them, the really bad boys, stayed out and they said, we're not coming in. And those guys reflagged, retitled their ownership structure um, and kept fishing. But they're still really tie owned. Um, they're just restructured. And that small set are still engaged in really bad stuff. And I we chased um, one of those fleets on the coast of Somalia. And it's a Thai owner, Thai family with Cambodian trafficked crew who were stuck there, but Djibouti flagged at the time and fishing illegally in Somali waters and ho horrible sea slavery conditions happening um, right there. That's a subset of players who've just decided to not comply. But the, the vast majority of the Thai overseas fishing fleet has been brought in and either had to clean up their act or have anchored there ever since. So I guess finally, um, you know, we focus much of this conversation on kind of just one chapter of your book on, on, on sea slavery, an important chapter of, of your book. But I, I'm wondering sort of what this issue says about sort of governance of the oceans more broadly and, and what else can be done to, um, you know, sort of make this sea a less lawless place or a place that's more um, reflective of, of, you know, how the legal structures and, and laws are, are in place on in, 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 in land. So I think on the simplest level, the sea slavery, you know, there, there are all these different, the book talks about a wide spectrum of um, human rights, labor and environmental abuses out there at sea from, you know, illegal dumping of oil to arms trafficking, to human slavery, to murder with impunity, you know, um, uh, and, um, the point it attempts to make is that uh, there's a wide range of behavior out there that's extra legal and illegal and abusive at its core, and there's a real lack of governance um, uh, and policing occurring out there. And the sea slavery component of that is, to some degree, uh, an acute version of it. I think it makes the point that 
things we thought were largely controlled, you know, isolated pockets of sweatshop workers here and abused workers there on land um, exist uh, still. Um, but the pervasiveness and the impunity with which it occurs at sea, I think, um, is a fairly new point that has to be reckoned with. Um, and I think this, the, what it tells us about governance is that um, exerting authority in this space by governments or corporations or consumers or NGOs or whomever is especially difficult because of the nature, the geography of the space. It's so far out of sight and out of mind. The nature of the workforce, constantly transient, multinational, um, the corporate structure, uh, and one of the most complicated shell structures, you know, kind of Russian dolls, you know, um, uh, uh, companies within companies within subsidiary companies. Um, for all of those reasons, um, this is a very difficult place to police. And the fact that on the high seas, which belong to everyone and no one, there's really little incentive for any country to sort of exert the resources to police it. So all that is to say that unless there is an outcry from the public, um, this this frontier will probably remain fairly lawless. Now, um, can it be policed? Yes. Are, are there, is there, you know, any sliver of hope in terms of concrete ways to do it? Yeah. The port state measures is an example of one of the, you know, if it, it is a agreement between a collection of countries that said, anytime a ship comes to any of our ports on our shores, we are going to flag to anyone. We are going to all share this set of standards as to how we're going to treat that ship in terms of inspecting environmental and human rights concerns. And that's a perfect example of a way that countries can come together and exert control over this space, even if they're not putting ships out in the space. They're still exerting control because those ships eventually have to come into port somewhere. Um, so I do, I do think there are methods, um, you know, big data drones, there's lots of technology out there now that also allow for us to put eyes on the space and to see what's happening to some degree out there. And though that technology plus sort of international coalitions that decide to do something about this, um, I think could spell for improvements. Uh, well, Ian, thank you so much for your time and I'll post a link to your book on the website. It was great. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Ian. That was helpful. And the book is great. I will post a link to it on the website, as I said earlier. I so encourage everyone to check it out. All right. See you next time. Bye.